Welcome to Conscious Co-Creation, Straight Talk About the Mind, Body, Spirit, and I am really thrilled today because today I have the beautiful Kelly Orchard. And I am really thrilled today because she has a beautiful spirit and she has a fiery spirit. And she's a beautiful author, radio host, writer, and I'm really thrilled today because today we're talking about heart lessons. And that is a dear subject to me. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you today, Carly. I love the subject of heart lessons because it brings and ties into gratitude, which is a very dear subject to me. So I'd love to know a little bit about the actual, what was the, the thing that brought, in other words, what was the wonderful inspiration behind heart lessons? Well, it's, it's kind of my journey of uh, self-realization and what happened was I had this 30-year career in broadcasting and it was getting to a point where I was a single mom and I had been uh, ready to sort of, you know, my kids were getting older and I was ready to kind of move on to the next phase of my career and I was struck down with heart failure and it really derailed my life but part of what happens is that I had already always all for since I was 15 years old been keeping a journal so the entire time that I was going through this medical crisis I was keeping a journal of all of my thoughts all of my feelings everything that was going on with me and I started to realize as I was coming out of it all of the lessons that I had been learning and so it just kind of came naturally that this was a book that I needed to share with others because what happened to me during this journey this process was I learned that to find your heart's desire you don't need to look any further than your own backyard so you already have it in your heart and so the, the, there be these dual metaphors started like flying at me all the time it's like here was my heart my physical heart it was ill it was sick I wasn't really you know I was I had to learn all about how the heart functions and then also I was realizing that this entire time even though I loved my family and I loved my you know my life and I was I had a good life I wasn't necessarily following my own heart's desire and so while I was in this process of learning it was it was clear to me that I'd always wanted to be a writer and I had kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off because I had uh, obligations. There was work obligations or there were raising a family obligations or whatever, uh, you know, I got to pay my bills. I can't really, you know, sit down and write a book right now. Are you kidding? Well, this sort of taught me that, uh, you know, it's never too late to follow your heart and change a dream. I had to basically reinvent my entire life and discovered during this process that I didn't really choose broadcasting. It was sort of choice, chosen for me. And I decided that I wanted to be in the helping field. I wanted to help others who had gone through some sort of similar life derailing crisis and so I uh, decided that I was going to go back to school and get a degree so that I could be a licensed marriage and family therapist. So the book sort of was born out of all of that because I was journaling this entire time, this entire process and these are the lessons that I learned and in the first book, the first volume of Heart Lessons, I share five lessons that I learned and in the process of the writing the book as I was getting my you know my education in psychotherapy I used uh, actual you know psychological uh, methods and processes to encourage and help others start asking the questions of what's going on in their life so this book sort of that's how it was born now how would you say gratitude ties into all this Because obviously the journey of you know when you get sick and you're going through the, the grieving process where did you find that you really dived into the gratitude part well gratitude hasn't come up in this this particular book this is lessons in surrendering lessons in grief lessons in patience lessons in discipline and um, gosh now I've already forgotten what this last lesson was um, lessons in what did I say patience discipline grief and um, listening lessons and listening and right now I'm in the process of writing volume two which is lessons in gratitude and there are things that you become thankful for you know for example you know so to be grateful for 
the, the events that occur in your life that cause you to stop and think, even if it's a bad thing, there's something to be grateful for it because it's setting you on a new path or maybe it's, it's creating this, this sense of, I'm so grateful for when times are good. You know, so there is a, this gratitude about being grateful for the obstacles that come in your way because it's an opportunity to learn, learn more about yourself, learn more about others, learn more about life in general and how things work. And so gratitude is, is that's, part, that's part of volume two. So then let's go back to volume one then. You said you have five steps. So why don't you share with us actually the five steps? I think that would be very valuable tools for the audience. So why don't you well, actually walk us through those five steps? Yeah, I'd love to. Here's, here's the book. Here's the cover of the book, um, which this in itself is, is a story because my daughter and I actually went out and took this photograph and uh, created this ourselves. So this, is, this, was, this was a really fun process, and it was, that too was, was lessons to be learned about heart lessons. But the first lesson that I talk about is lessons in surrendering. And for, in this example, lessons in surrendering, when you're, when you're in a crisis or you're coming up on a crisis or anything that's going on in your life, it's really important because what we do is we hang on to whatever it is that we think we're supposed to be and or what we're supposed to have so we hit a crisis so maybe we lose a job or a relationship is starting to end or our children are leaving home and you know we're in a period of transition but we're still trying to hang on to the past we're trying to hang on what to what was good it's like oh my god i can't i can't lose my home i got to hang on to that or i can't lose this really great executive job uh, you know i have to i have to maintain this same level that, of achievement that i have have gotten to or I'm going to be grieving that my children are leaving I've got to hang on to this this family unit that I have have had for such a long time and lessons in surrendering is is to learn to some things you just don't have any control over and it's important to learn to just surrender to that course and in in my book I talk about how I have this whole Wizard of Oz Dorothy sort of you know, a theme that I have been using, which is why red slipper coaching came about and I have this whole shoe metaphor and everything else. But part of where it came from was that I started realizing that to search for, you know, find your heart's desire. You didn't need to look any further than your own backyard. And that's what's already within you. And I learned about surrendering. And this is how it came about was I started thinking about the Wizard of Oz story and, and you know, in, in the movie, in the film, there's the scene where Dorothy is in Oz and the Wicked Witch of the West is flying over Oz and she's writing in the sky, surrender Dorothy or else. And everybody's afraid and they're, they're scared and they're hiding and they're trembling. And they, you know, and they don't want to, they don't want to give up Dorothy. And so I realized, first of all, in the metaphor, I'm Dorothy. I'm the one who's been seeking my heart's desire, looking over the rainbow, you, you know the drill. And it came to me, the conclusion, or the, uh, the realization that a simple comma was what changed everything for me. So I realized that the Wicked Witch was my heart problem. I was having a chronic heart issue, and I was afraid of it. I was scared of it. I was, I was trembling. I was trying to hide from it. I was in denial about it, that it was really having this strong impact on my real life. You know, it was like I was like, I was thinking, no, I'm going to move on. I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to act as if it's not really having an impact on my life. And really, in reality, I was afraid of it. So when you take the surrender Dorothy, and I'm Dorothy, and you put a comma in between them, all of a sudden you have surrender Dorothy. And I realized, okay, I have to surrender to my heart crisis and just sort of go with it and realize that it's not going to heal itself on my time frame. I have to be patient with it and I have to let it do run its course and that is what basically was going on with me as I was fighting it I wasn't wasn't giving into the fact that it had had such a significant impact and so in the first chapter of the book lessons in surrendering it's about it's about the nest the necessity of if you don't have any control over it you're not going to be able to resolve it in your time frame whatever the issue is it's you just need to surrender to it and let I don't know God the universe the the time pass that needs to pass to just to surrender to it and I use an example of lessons in water skiing have you ever learned to water ski 
Water skiing is an interesting thing, cause I, and I, and I did read it, read your book, and it was, and you're right. It's like when people are holding on, mm -hmm. when, 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 it's like, and they're treading water, and water's going up their nose, and they're swallowing the water instead yeah. of just letting go uh -huh. of the of the pole, you know, of, of the yeah, like with roll, but you know what I'm saying, just yeah. letting go of the pole, right? It's yeah. like. It's like let go, let go, and it's yeah. like they're still holding on. They're being uh -huh. dragged under the water. Yeah, with this with this notion that if I held on long enough, I'm going to be able to get back up. And and we do that in life, you know, when we when we enter into a crisis where we hang on to it. It's like. You know, I even have a friend now who who is in jeopardy of losing their home, but they're doing everything they possibly can to save their home. And it's like, let it go. Just let go of the rope. It's probably you're going to be so relieved when it's just done. You you can move into another home. You're not going to be homeless, you know. And it's like I know you've loved your home, but if something just is not going to suit your life and it's causing you complete misery, you've got to surrender to it. Surrender. You know, for me it was a health crisis, but it was also other things that I was having, you know, it just kind of like every, the dominoes were just falling and there was nothing I could do but surrender and just, okay, this is it. This is what happened. So it's really that's like the old analogy of pushing the boulder up the hill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I just, I just kind of took that whole analogy and just sort of switched it around to, you know, lessons in water skiing. You got to let go of that rope. You know, and it's uh, it seems to be resonating a lot with uh, the people that I'm sharing it with, and with especially in the book, it's like, wow, that one, that one really struck home for a lot of people. You know, it really did. Yeah. And so then, then I move on to lessons in grief because when you surrender, you're, there's going to be grief and loss. And during my time while I was in grad school, I worked a lot in grief and loss, and it took a while for me to even realize that I too would, had been grieving. I had been grieving the loss of the life I was thought I was going to have. And I had to grieve the healthy lifestyle that was no longer part of my, you know, my daily routine. I was ill and I had, I was grieving. Heck, I was just grieving the loss of summer vacation and having a tan and hanging out by the pool. I was, there was so many different things I was grieving. And a lot of people attribute grief and loss to just death. But there's so much more that you grieve. You grieve relationships. You grieve jobs. You grieve, you know, your old hometown. You grieve. You grieve high school. <laughs> you know, you grieve. There's all sorts of things that you that you lose over the course of your lifetime. That grief and loss is just is just part of the journey. And once you understand what the symptoms are and you accept that grief and loss is not just death, that you're going to go through all of these phases and all of the stages of grief. When you can identify them, it just makes it more. You, you sort of accept it, and you, you come to that understanding. You bring up an extremely valid point. I've been asked to write a book of exactly what you're talking about. Too many people think that grief is just about death and dying, and it's not. You're so absolutely right. People do not understand that we do grieve and go through the exact same five stages mm -hmm. for every single thing in, in daily and daily aspects of life. Yeah. Like just like you said, when we lose a job, when we go through a divorce, people that lose limbs, mm -hmm. people that have you know, they go through the phantom you know, phantom limb syndrome, exactly. people that post traumatic stress disorder. Um I mean literally so many things. Like you said, when when people go when people get diagnosed with something, I mean there's so many things that we go through, little even things. I mean I, I, I can't believe how people do not understand that it's not just when someone dies. And it's, it's, it's such an amazing, it's an amazing subject. And I've had so many clients that I deal with that I actually go through them with the five stages. And they're like, why hasn't someone written a book that's mm -hmm. not just about death and dying? Mm -hmm. So I'm so, I'm so happy that you brought that up because it is a big subject. And, 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 you know, and honestly, until I was in it, I, I had forgotten too, you know, it's like I had experienced, you know, the death of a loved one at, at a young age and I had been, I've probably been to as many funerals as I have been to weddings. And even then I didn't understand that I too was having experiences of grief and loss until I started, until I started educating myself. And I think that that's the point is that what we're doing right now, you and I, we're sharing the education of, hey, you're going through the symptoms of grief and loss. I work with clients all the time now who don't even really realize that the, the, the loss of the job or the loss of the relationship or the loss of 
um, you know, they've moved and now they're living in a new community and they're missing their friends. It's like these are symptoms of grief and loss. And even when they're saying, but what if I did that? And what if I did this? And maybe I should have done that. It's like, oh, really? That's the bargaining of the symptom. You know, and so I'm like, I'm, what, I'm taking them through each and every stage of grief and loss and expl explaining to them how they're in that phase. And what happens is this, that they have the light bulb goes on. And they're like, oh, so I'm normal with these feelings? Yeah, you're normal, just like everybody else. You are, and uh, I love grief and loss, and and I don't mean that in a like, yay, we're all grieving and lost. You know, it's but I love it because when you realize that there are actual stages and actual symptoms, and that you are completely normal, you're not going crazy when you feel this way. There's this sense of calmness and acceptance, and it's like, oh, okay, like this breath, like. Oh. And so I love working with people who are in, in grief and loss because I love giving them comfort and peace of mind that it's, you're okay. You're not crazy. You're absolutely not crazy. And that's the same thing with people that are ill. A lot of people, it's not because, it's not, it's not like someone wants to know that they're really ill. It's just mm -hmm. that they finally get some sort of diagnosis. They can actually breathe and then they know what to do next. Mm-hmm. And then, so it's like with, you know, some of the, like, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, I can I can never say that name correctly, but you know what I'm saying? It's a, a lot of people say they're crazy or they're hyper, hypochondriacs. It's not that they are. It's that they just want to have some sort of closure or something they can work with so they can move forward. That's all people want is some sort of peace of mind so that they can breathe and they can move forward. And it, it is so important. It's like you said so that they are normal, so they can actually go, oh my god, I can actually do this, I'm actually going through these stages, oh wow, great, now I can actually do something with this. That's what a lot of this work is, is giving people the tools so they can do something. I, I totally agree with you on that, 100%, because once you know what the situation is, then you can also reach out to others who have a similar situation and then you find a community. You, know, you call them tribe. You know, you, you find a tribe of people who get you, but it, unless you understand, until somebody tells you, it's like, this is what's going on with you, and it's like, oh, okay, so I, that's why I, I do love what I do now, you just like, so I made this whole transition with the heart problem, which is why I wrote Heart Lessons, is because here I am, I'm working in the mental health field, and people, you know, it's like my, bi my biography, or my, you know, my bio says, broadcast, is like, well, how'd you go from broadcasting to mental health, you know, and, and I have to share the story about this bridge, you know, it's like, well, this is how it happened, and so that's, that's where the book came from, you know, so I went through, I had to surrender, and I went through the grief and loss, and then I had to listen, I had to listen to, you know, I had to listen to my body, I had to listen to my, what my heart really, truly wanted, and that's another thing that, that individuals, you know, which is what I'm trying to teach, is that, listen, and observe not only to yourself but listen to those around you listen to the people that you are engaging with and communicating with and listen to your body what is your body telling you you know this is this is stamp you know this this is cognitive behavioral therapy when you're in a situation and something is you know causing you anxiety that's a trigger so stop for a minute and pay attention be more mindful you know, that's what listening is also about mindfulness. You know, it's like be be aware of, of what your body is telling you and understanding and listening to your body. Um, because, you know, I say, hey, you know what? Heart failure occurred for me because I wasn't listening to my body. A lot of people said, you didn't know that your heart was beating that fast? Nope. You didn't know the symptoms? Well, I had symptoms, but I brushed them off as something else. You know, I just didn't think that they were, they were, you know, relevant to what was going on. Or I brushed it off to something, some other cause. Like, oh, I had a really good workout today, but I didn't eat enough carbs. You know, so it's like listening is really important to listen to your body. And I know that you, you know this. <laughs> Yep, and it is, and you know, a lot of people like to push things away, I mean, one of my things, I just push through the pain all the time, and you know, after a while, you can only push through pain through so much, and then you eventually just have to really sit back and listen, and it's so vitally important to, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to listen to your body, we would like to not, because it's easier to put your head in the sand, mm -hmm. and go, oh, you know, I'll just deal with that later, I'll just deal with that later, and it, it's just so important to listen to your body, and, and, and literally 
do what you have to do to to actually take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just really important to do that. Yeah, and 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 enough of us, and I say us because you know I'm still guilty of it. I still have to be mindfully aware of taking care of myself and practicing self care. But that's one of the biggest things that I, I tell my clients. You know, is what do you do on a daily basis? for yourself and it doesn't always have to be you know spending money on a massage or taking a, an exorbitant amount of time to pamper yourself but it's important really to be mindful of how you're caring for yourself and so I start out every morning you know with with a morning walk you know which clears my head it gets me prepared for the day it's the first thing so I, then I can get along get about my day and feel like I've done something good for myself and like you said sometimes we just push through the pain or push through a headache or because and 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 what's the reason because we're obligated to finish some sort of a task is that why we do it or we don't want to spend the time feeling sorry for ourselves and so therefore we neglect what our true needs are which is we have to take care of our body first before we can and our mind and our spirit before we can take care of anything else it's not only that it's like also we can't be there for others if we're not, you know, if we're not healthy and if we're not feeling well, we can't really truly be fully available emotionally, spiritually, physically for others. And yeah. a lot of people don't get that. Yeah, we can partially be there. However, we can't fully 100% be there for others. Not fully. We're partially there, not fully. And do we want to be there? In other words, we want people to be there fully for for us. Do we want to be there partially for others? Yes. Um, the, you know, and that and what you you just brought up a a topic that just came to my mind because sometimes I try to multitask, and I could be you know like working on a project over here and on the phone over here and still sending emails, and then all of a sudden I have to stop and sit back and realize. Okay, who are you supposed to be mindful of right now? You know, multitasking is not really the best case scenario when you need to be present and listening to somebody else. And so we do the same things with ourselves when we aren't taking care of ourselves because we're too busy taking care of others and then all of a sudden here we are we're sick for, you know, a week or so because we didn't take care of our bodies or, you know, like I was guilty of the fact that I was trying to run a business. I was raising three teenagers. I was a single mom. I was maintaining a household. I was trying to, you know, do do so much and then I was not listening to my body. I wasn't taking care of what was going on with me inside even though I still lived a healthy lifestyle. I was still working out. I wasn't abusing drugs or alcohol. I just had some sort of a virus that affected the electrical system of my heart and caused it to just kind of freak out. And, but the thing was, is I, I didn't pay attention to the symptoms. And it, it could be something as little as that, you know, it, that it's really important to kind of stop and take stock, you know, take, take, a, take a mindful, you know, internal stock of what's happening to you before anything else goes on. Because you're right, you can't take care of anybody else if you're not well. And the other thing too is you got to remember if you are not, it's kind of like if you have so much noise going on exteriorly, you can't actually hear internally. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's so much noise going on, it's really hard to hear what's going on inside. Yeah. You so know, that, that's a big one. That is a big one. And that's a lesson I had to learn too is like learn to appreciate the solitude for a while. You know, and learned that because that is what's what was listening was about for me was was learning to appreciate the quietness, spending time by yourself, and and being able to listen to what's going on inside of you, your your mind, your thoughts, your heart, you know, your emotions, and get really getting understanding. Because you're right, it's like the the television with technology today, the TV, the 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 internet, the radio, that the, everything that goes on outside uh, in the outside world, it's. There's so much stimulation that taking time to st stop and just listen to what's going on inside will do wonders. I even tell my clients when they say, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy for that. I say, 10 minutes between when you leave your work before you head for home. Sit in your car. Just 10 minutes. 
No radio, no music, no nothing. Just sit there and just listen to yourself breathe. Calm yourself. You know, and I use these shoe metaphors. It's like change your shoes. Change, change your metaphorical shoes from work mode to going home mode. And just take an extra 10 minutes before you get on the freeway. You know, it'll, you, it'll, it'll be an amazing transformation, but you have to practice it. And there's no reason, there's no excuse why you can't take that 10 minutes for yourself for the day. Ah, another great one for that is in the morning in the shower. Mm -hmm. That is such a great time to be in silence. Just feeling the water beat, beat on your body and just literally breathe when you're in the water. It's such a, a great time to be in cleansing mode. Just actually visualize the water cleansing everything out of you, cleansing from connecting from anybody, disconnecting from anybody, and just literally breathe with the water. It's such a great time to be in silence. And just literally, it's such a, an amazing time to be in silence. Because you already are in silence. You're, you're, with, you're just with the water. It's such a great time to just almost, in a weird way, be in meditation. No, like, actually, I love that. I love that whole idea of cleansing, you know. The, the, well, I actually, I have a, I have, it's called cutting cords. You get up in the morning and you actually visualize cutting cords with all beings in all directions of time. Because what we don't get is at nighttime, whether people like to kind of know this or not, we actually travel. You know, you travel in your dreams, you go into other dimensions, if you will. And so I always tell people, you get up in the morning and you actually kind of visualize cutting cords, all beings in all directions of time. And so it's a way of actually cutting cords and actually visualize the water cleansing your body from your night travels and just literally just cleansing your whole auric field, if you will. And then you actually visualize cocooning your body for your day. Actually, just actually um, just cocooning your body from all ex ex extra energy or noise because you know you get bombarded with everybody coming at you and extra 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 layers of noise if you will and just cocooning yourself and protecting yourself in a way of not having all that extra noise so, so in a way you're actually cleansing you're cutting away all the extra cores that you've had that bombarded from the day before and then you're actually cocooning with new energy, new, you know, I don't know, love, whatever you want to call it, whatever you, what it is for you, universe, God, or whatever it is, and putting on a layer of protection for the day. So it serves as both purposes, a cleansing and a layer of protection for the day. So it's kind of like a little mini meditation. Yeah, I love that. I do. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So what else do you have going on? I know you have all sorts of beautiful things going on. you got new coaching programs and... We have new a new volume coming out, and what else you have going on? Well, this this volume one heart lessons just came out, and I'm so I'm working on volume two. There will end up being three because there were 15 lessons that I identified, and I wanted to sort of release them in short spurts so that it was, you know, easily read, readable. Um, I have some workshops. You know, I live in Southern California, and I'm putting together a, a life transition workshop, which is, you know, it's like something we talk about all the time. It's like, don't make any New Year's resolutions. They don't work. They never work. You, nobody ever stays with a New Year's resolution, but you can make a commitment to a life transition. And, you know, I, I love people in transition, baby boomers, people with, you know, there's a chronic crisis that are going on. Those are sort of my, you know, that's my little niche there. And um, so I've got a couple webinars that I'm that I'm putting on, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm sort of uh, coming up with this. Uh, don't you know how to avoid becoming the lonely, depressed little old lady? <laughs> <laughs> I worked I, for you know while I was working as an intern. You know, I'm a licensed therapist now, and so this has been a career transition for me, a complete reinvention. While I was working as an intern. I uh, was working with a pr in a program for late life depression. So the the population was people over 65. You had, or I think you had to be over 60, but most of my clients were 65 to 75 ish, and most of them were female. I had very few men. Now, there, first of all, there's a stigma of even acknowledging at that age, acknowledging that you're having these symptoms of depression. There's also the um, the idea that this is just old age, and the, you know, and and so they they're less likely to reach out for help. And this was a prevention and early intervention program, and I was really enjoying it. I loved working with this population and saw such 
great strides that once they committed to the program they were they were really pulling out of this depression but what kept happening to me with as I'm meeting with these clients is like how did you get to this point in your life where you're at this age and you're so lost and you don't have the tools to live a happy life and you're just now starting to learn it and I just sort of made a commitment that I want to I want to get to people before they get to that stage so that's why I'm sort of gearing up towards you know get a grip and how to how to avoid becoming that lonely depressed little old lady or like my my younger daughters in their 20s would say uh, how to avoid becoming that cat, cat lady down the street <laughs> you know so so those are some of the things that I've been working on for 2014 and uh, you know this is just all part of the process of you know reinvention Ooh, I like that. I do want to let everyone know that we are on intentionradio.com. Please make sure you go visit intentionradio.com. Also, please go check out the intentioncall.com. Actually, it is intentioncall.com. It's a group of people that get together every Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and they intend on wonderful things. They actually intend on whether it be uh, whether there's a tsunami somewhere or they're intending about group love or it could be about uh, group prayer or anything. But anyways, they're wonderful people. It's a great place to visit. And I also let everyone know we are also doing this as a podcast. So please, Kelly, let everyone know where they can also find you. Well, you can find me, thank you very much, at redslippercoaching.com. Pretty easy. It's like remember remember Dorothy and the red shoes, red slipper coaching.com. I'd also like to get in, I'd like to actually I would like to um, swing around into gratitude too, because I think we touched on, a, you know, because you are talking about the heart, I do want to touch upon gratitude. I think gratitude is such a wonderful thing. So we have touched upon your five lessons, and I know it isn't into your next volume, but since we are mm -hmm. talking about heart, yes. heart lessons, let's touch yes. upon gratitude. All right, let's talk about gratitude. Um, there's so many things that gratitude can do for your mental state, right? And you know this very well. Being great, there, I like to use like the laws of physics, and you know, and brain science, and you know, the the endorphins and the the dopamine, the the brain chemicals are so affected by our thoughts and our feelings, and so when we change our thoughts it starts to change the brain chemistry so when you go into something with a loving attitude or an attitude of gratefulness whatever it is it starts changing the brain chemistry of of your entire you know and then and that's that that in turn affects your entire body so going into with an attitude of gratitude for anything even just you know being grateful for the smallest thing i learned i learned i am grateful for this red rose today even if that's all that I have all day long to be thankful for, I am grateful that I was able to stop and smell this red rose today. And if every day you go into, with, I'm going to find five things to be grateful for, then it starts to change your whole attitude, your mindset, because you start to look for things to be thankful for because you've made a commitment to yourself to be grateful. And um, I encourage my clients to start a gratitude journal. Because it really changes everything. They actually did a study that when you actually write your gratitude list before you go to bed, it mm -hmm. actually works on your thoughts overnight. And when you get up, you're actually more positive. Yeah, because, it does. Because what most people don't understand is that when you're writing, you're engaging your entire body. You're engaging muscles everywhere. It changes your, like you said, it changes your chemistry, changes your physiology. So that when you get up in the morning, you're actually more positive. It's engaging parts of your brain that we're not even aware of, and it is actually working your unconscious. Therefore, it works. And if you're you're doing that every single night for 30 days, it's actually changing a habit. Therefore, it actually also is changing your whole physiology and your brain chemistry. And then boost to serotonin, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually is an amazing thing to do every night. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you brought you brought up physiology. Um, 
you know, sometimes you, you get on these you get on these live programs and you forget your words. I've been having that issue lately. It's like, oh wait. Um, but yeah, it does change your entire physiology, and I've seen it work with my clients. It works with me. I'm hey, I already admit I'm a big journaling person, and uh, it's easy to write the negatives, but you need to stop and write the positives of things that you're grateful for and you, you'd be amazed at the list of things you can be you can find to be thankful for and so writing down your thankful thoughts or your gratitudes before you go to bed you're right it has a dual purpose it, it the physical you know the physiology changes and the mindset but then the, when you wake up in the morning and that list is right there by your bedside you automatically are gonna read those things that you wrote the night before and you start your day off in a really positive note it's like oh yeah today I'm gonna to look for more things to be thankful for and like you said after 30 days you're changing a habit and all of a sudden your entire mindset your physiology your the way you think everything is different and you go into it almost every single situation with looking for something to be grateful for. The other thing I want to address because you brought it up and it just it, it, it actually in a weird way almost saddens me um, is that you said that people are, there's that stigma about not asking for help mm -hmm. and I know I'm regressing here a little bit but I did want to address this. So I really encourage people that you know seeking help or going to get help is not a bad thing and I don't it's it saddens me that people are afraid to go get help or say that they see a therapist I don't care if it's a life coach or if it's a licensed therapist or whatever it is don't be afraid to go ask for help and you know don't be the person that waits till they're you know I don't care if you're 20 30 40 50 60 I don't care how old you are um, really it will change your life and just make sure you, you find something you resonate with and that's why I like doing these video shows uh, don't go seek someone out from the yellow pages. Go find someone that you know who has seen somebody. Ask people because you want to find someone that you resonate with because that's the person you're going to get the most benefit from. If you mm -hmm. resonate with someone and it's someone that you actually really connect with, that's the person you're really going to benefit from and that's the person who's going to help change your life. So I really encourage everybody to go out there and if you're having some sort of issue, really go out there and do something with your life and seek the help that you need because it really will change your life. You don't want to be the cat woman or the person that's you know, seven years old and wishing and regretting that you've done something differently. Um, I really encourage everyone to go out there and do what you need to do for yourself. And that's why I love these video shows because you really can connect with people visually, auditory, you know, you hear the voice, you hear the facial, you see the facial expressions, whatever. So, you know, and there's plenty of people that do videos that are therapists that are life coaches go on YouTube go on Vimeo there's tons of people out there that actually do these types of shows that are like I said therapists life coaches and that are really out there looking to help people so go find somebody I'd love that thank you for you know for, for promoting that because that's what I do too on um, I do a, a podcast called what women want to talk about and it's with it's all about women uh, on their website and it started out with talking to other mental health professionals about the issues that women typically bring into therapy and you know talking about the stigma it is it is sad because the reality is is that you you are engaging with somebody who is there 100% invested in you it, this, this is not for you to, to go and be told everything that's wrong with you. And I think that's why a lot of people are, are afraid to go to therapy because I don't want somebody telling me all that's wrong with me and that's not what therapy is and there's so many different methods that, that are being used now. Like you said, like life coaching or development coaching. Uh, you don't have to necessarily go see a therapist if that's what, you know, you, if you don't really want to go to a therapist. But there is a stigma to it especially with the older generation uh, and the older generation probably wouldn't be watching videos right now because they they're not engaged in the technology but what I found in that particular part of the field is that by the time you get to that age 65 70 75 we are taught now in in our age demographic that to look forward never look back always be pressing forward and don't look at your past but you know what happens when you get to that age that age all you do is look back that's all you do is you look back on your life and you reflect and you want to do life reviews and this is very therapeutic and very helpful for the aging the aging person is to kind of go back and do a life review so stop what you're doing right now 
and think about your 70, 75 year old self. What are you going to look back on? Are you going to have any regrets because you didn't take the step to get some help that could change your life for the better? Is that what is that who you want to be at that age? And so that's what I don't know, Carly, I think that's what you and I both do. We help people get on the right path, get on the right track, follow their heart and live in a life of gratitude. And you know, like you said, mind, body, business and soul. I love that. I also want to send out a special shout out to men because you know we're always there's so many women's groups there's women there's women business groups there's women this there's women that and there's not many groups for men I really encourage men to get out there and, and find men's groups and I really encourage men to realize that it is okay for men also to ask for help you you see so many so much more support for women than there is for men and I think Therapy also is there's been a lot more stigma for men to go seek out for help, and you know like I know you do a lot of women's women's uh, you know help. I tend to have a balance of 50-50 men and female. I really want to also reach out to the men and realize that it is okay. It does not make a man weak or any less than to go get help. So this is also a shout out for the men. And I appreciate that. It's just funny because. Um one of my colleagues said that I was I I'm sort of I seem to be sort of a magnet for um for for men because most of my client base is men even though I I tend to speak to women and I had that that initial uh you know that was where I was going to go because they're you're always saying it's like okay create your niche and have a specialty and and so women is my specialty because I'm a woman who went through a transition a life transition however I'm finding that uh men really you know really seem to take to me probably because of my business background because I can talk business and I know business and that's where my background comes from and radio is a men's field you know it's like it's primarily it's a male dominated or um, uh, industry and so I I can talk the men's game and so you're right it's like reaching out to men it's like hey it's not that scary it really isn't it's it's actually an act of courage and ba bravery to go to somebody and say you know what I could really use some help right now it's like asking for directions you know I love that and one of the things that I think I, I really resonate with you is because we both have some we both carry a lot of male energy and it is because we both have a, a, a strong business background and because we both do this we both we both speak um, and you know it's kind of funny and so yeah I think I think men are drawn to that when you have a strong personality or both fiery spirits so I think that's one of the things I really loved about you and I was really excited to have you on because I think we could have a really fun banter which we are but anyways yeah I, I think it's very important for men to realize that it is very important to also reach out and and I think it's a really it also helps for relationships and also helps for business so I think it's a really great thing so I also want to bring it around to that I'm in such gratitude for having you and and having you share with me about gratitude and the five stages because I'm so happy that someone else also gets that we go through the five stages in our daily lives I, I talk about this all the time and it's so nice to hear someone else also get that I feel the same exact way, Carly. With the last three minutes of your of your of your speaking, it's like I feel that a, a similar energy with you, and I'm so glad that you asked me to be on your program today. And I too always look for somebody who has the same philosophy on grief and loss and gratitude. Um, so thank you so much for for having me on today. And this was a fun banter. A lot of it fun. was. I can't we believe time's have, up already. We still have a few more minutes, so I'm excited. Oh, so I also want to go back to tying this all in together. How also plays into the five stages with gratitude because I find that they all are intertwined. Yeah. Well, you know, I always tell my clients that you know the stages of grief, or grief and loss, are there. It's not linear. You know, there are five stages, but you don't go through one and then you gradually move to the other and then you move to the other and then you move to the other. You could be in several of them at the same time and, and they're more circular or they're inter they're going, you know, they're they're infinity, you know, they're they're intertwined. You could be, you know, in denial and acceptance at the same exact time, you know, and, and that's how gratitude works as well. You know, it's like it could be 
the absolute worst event that you could possibly imagine that's happening to you right now. Like, for example, a young woman diagnosed with cancer. And everybody is so sad because she's got a young son. And they don't understand why this young woman has been diagnosed with cancer and maybe she's going to die, maybe she's not. Nobody really knows what the outcome is going to be. So where's where's what's there to be grateful with that, right? And I had to I, I shared with a with the woman that was crying over it. I said, but look at the impact that this young woman has had on your life right now. That's where you become thankful and grateful, is because she has had such a strong impact on your life that you are showing gifts of gratitude, that you're thankful that you knew her, that you're thankful that she's having this time with her son, you're grateful for the lessons that, she, that you're learning through watching her be strong. So there's always something that you can find, some little nugget of every situation that you're in to find something to show gratitude over. You know, even even if you're starving and you get that crumb of food, be grateful for it. You know, it gave you exactly what you needed at exactly the right time. That's what I have found through going through all those five stages that no matter what you're going through in that moment, there's always a gift within the trauma. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, there's always something to be thankful for in it. Whether it be that you know you meet that nurse, and then there's something that there's there's always an epiphany. I, I can't you know I've had well I'm going on my 30th surgery um, in January. This coming yeah this coming January I have another surgery coming up. But it's amazing even through all the everything else I've been through, there's always been an epiphany that I've had, or some you know something miraculous has happened out of that. And it's like just amazing. You just there's another wake up call. There's another aha moment. There's another gift. There's another you know. There's just always something that's come out of it. Where it's just another layer, another onion peeling. You know, it just there's just always something amazing. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I agree. Just, you know, like we were talking about earlier. You know, the showing the, you know the gifts of gratitude, how it changes your physiology and and your you know your habits but there's also those other gifts of gratitude you know for the little small things the people you might meet or that you wouldn't have met um, you know like my I remember a story of, of uh, having to turn around you know on a I was on a trip home and it was gonna be a long drive like seven hours and uh, my son had forgotten his backpack back at my parents house and we were there for a visit and so we had to turn around and go back and it was a good hour out of our way but my parents decided to come and meet us so we had another meal with them and my dad had to remind me he said you know be grateful it's so don't be so angry because what happened is you might have just avoided an accident that would have killed all of you or you may have avoided you know and he, he kind of like named off a few things and it, it helped me to also acknowledge that you know be grateful for even these small things because you don't know what you just avoided you know, or what could have happened had everything gone, had you expected it to go. And you never know. I've heard so many stories of people had turned around and they did go back and saw an accident. Yeah. You know, or they didn't get on that plane and the plane crashed. Exactly. Or, yeah. for example, I'll give you a perfect example. 9-11. I was yeah. missed the plane by one hour. I was on my way to work that day. And my client called the night before and canceled his appointment. Now I would have been there. And I chose to sleep in, and normally I would have gone to work and just worked out. But I chose not to. I chose to sleep in. And if he hadn't called and canceled his appointment, I would have been there. So, you know, it's like you never, ever know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's those types of things, you know. So yeah. you always have to be grateful for those types of situations. Yeah. Yeah, so and that's, just, and that's the thing about life, you know, I, whether you believe in karma, whether you believe in fate, destiny, you know, you, you just never ever know and I think everyone needs to be okay with what everyone believes in. Some people believe in reincarnation, some people don't, so, you know, everyone has their own philosophy and I think we all need to learn to accept each person's ideology or, or, or whatever. And I think if we could all learn to agree to disagree or to be open to all points of view or perspectives, we'd be a lot happier. Well, we would definitely be living more at peace with one another if there was just a little bit of understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So since we are on a podcast, I'd love for you to let everyone know once again where we can find you. Thank you. I appreciate that opportunity. First, my name is Kelly Orchard. It's spelled O-R-C-H-A-R-D, just like the fruit trees. And you can find me at redslippercoaching.com. I send out a weekly little mind, body, spirit email to my uh, Red Slipper community. And, uh, you know, we let you know about some podcasts and uh, events and webinars that we put on. And I have some special coaching packages to help you get on the right path to follow your heart at any age like you know earlier you said doesn't matter how old you are 20 30 40 50 whatever it is it's never too early and it's never too late to start following your heart and that's pretty much what my mantra is so you can find me at redslippercoaching.com and where can they find your beautiful book well my beautiful book thank you very much is called heart lessons and you can get it on amazon.com however if you subscribe to my red slipper community I'll send you the ebook for free so you can either download it on Kindle or you can get it for free on your computer just by subscribing to my email list now that sounds like a beautiful deal yeah I, and yeah. I will, as usual I will put together a beautiful page on my website which will have all of our information with an embedded video and also an embedded podcast and also let everyone know that we are on intentionradio.com and also please everyone go check out the intention call which happens every Saturday at 3 p.m. and you must check it out because it's a beautiful group of people and you'll be on a call with thousands of people which is wonderful because a group intention is very very powerful so make sure you do go check that out and Kelly what would be some last words of wisdom that you like to leave the audience with Last words of wisdom, here you go. <clears throat> changing your life and following your heart is as easy as changing your shoes. I do a shoe metaphor. So the shoes are S is something very specific, H hopeful, O optimistic, E empowered, and then S successful. So if you want to follow your heart, all you got to do is change that attitude, change the mindset, change your shoes. And what would be three golden nuggets, three life lessons? Three life lessons? Okay, good. From I'll I'll take them from heart lessons. You know, like learn to surrender when whatever you're doing is just not working anymore. Let go of the rope in order to find your heart's desire. Make sure that you are finding your heart's desire by learning to listen. Listen to others, listen to your body, listen to what's going on around you, listen and observe. And then the other is lessons in grief. Understand that we all grieve the loss of things, people, relationships, and jobs. You're normal. So, but, but when, and once you realize that you're normal, maybe you'll reach out and seek some help and you'll get yourself on that right path. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And I'm just delighted to have had you. And I am sure that you and I will be having many more conversations. So thank you so much, Kelly. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you, everybody, for taking time to be with us. I am so happy to have you with us. And as usual, I love feedback. So if there's anything else you'd love to hear about, hear about please let us know. And I hope everybody has a beautiful night. Blessings to everybody. And I look forward to spending time with you next week. Good night, everybody.